all kinds of people from the house to the house you know there's no difference we all need some attention and some quality of life so uh let's regain trust in our government so you think the democratic party cares about black people believe it or not rex i think that tweet is part of the problem do you feel like we could have addressed this homeless issue much sooner you have to speak a word make it a good one Welcome back to The Word. I'm Jackie Ray. I'm excited to continue our election coverage. My next guest, I had a chance to go to her fundraising event. It was great. Her energy is amazing. I think you're going to enjoy her. She is running for District 2. Her name is Ketty Chiterio. How did I do? You did perfect. Awesome. I'm so excited to have you on the show. You have an amazing background. You were born in Italy, correct? Yes. That was not hard. I didn't do anything. I just that happened. was all your parents, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but I was reading your background. Uh, I ha I love sports, and I once I read that you had an opportunity to play professional basketball. I was like, what? And then when I met you in person, I was like, oh, now it makes sense. She's tall. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You too. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> so I just want to get a little bit about your background. Growing up in Italy, your family being very community oriented, what that meant to you, and how that shaped you. Yes. Well. Uh, I'm the last one of five children. So mm -hmm. there you have it. My community was uh, from the girl girl. Right. Uh, yes. My parents were fabulous. We have a beautiful, beautiful family. Uh, we love each other. We are very supportive of each other. Um, we are from a small town. So I think everybody knew us. We knew everybody. Uh, very community oriented. Uh, my father was the one who started me with in, in sports. He was an Olympian himself, 1948, a silver medal cyclist. Uh, and we all had to do sports somehow. Mm -hmm. We were all athletes. So I have brothers who uh, raced motorcycles, uh, my other sister basketball as well. Uh, I started with ballet. I love ballet. I wanted to be a ballerina, but I was a little chunky if i say and so what? my mom was like you need to play sports this is not your thing i was really mm -hmm. upset but then of course basketball became my love and uh, uh, i was doing pretty good and eventually i i was uh called by this uh, professional team when i was 17 and by 19 i was playing pro uh but then i wanted to travel experience the world and so i I left that. And then you took foreign, um, foreign languages, right? Is yes, that that's studied? what I studied. I studied, yeah, I studied uh, English, French, um, German, uh, pretty easy for me. I'm Italian and those are all of Latin, uh, Latin uh, roots. So uh, it was very easy for me. And then once I moved here, Spanish just came uh, on no issue. Yeah, I graduated in foreign languages because I wanted to work in tourism. Um, and I started uh, traveling for work. I would, uh, um, I would, uh, I had the best job. I worked for Club Mediterranean, which is a vacation resort kind of oh. uh, vacation. And uh, I had to just uh, enjoy myself 24 seven for four months at a time in a beautiful resort. And my, my job was to talk to people, make sure people were happy, fix the issues. And by, I believe 21, I was uh, in the operation uh, board where I had to run groups of like three or 400 people. So uh -huh. I was very young, but very determined. And I felt like it was, uh, I was getting overpaid for having fun, but I was actually doing something in a community. Uh, so I've always been a community person, as you can see. When did you meet your wife? I met my wife 20 years ago. Uh, I wish I had a crazy story. Like we were parachuting together and uh, no, or horseback riding on a beach and we met, but no, we, we had friends in common. Okay. Uh, they well, felt classic. like we were, yeah, yeah. No, it's a beautiful story, no matter what. Yeah. So when did you got, where did you guys meet and when did you guys decide that you wanted to make your way to California? Uh, well, I met my wife. I was already in California. I've been okay. in California for, I used to say half of my life, but I'm getting older. So a little bit more than half of my life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I tell you a funny, a funny thing between parentheses. Uh, when I officially 
uh, reached the half-life here and half-life in Italy, mm. I told people, you know, next year I'm going to lose my accent because I'm going to be more American than Italian. Well, it didn't happen. I yeah. still have a little accent. <laughs> but yeah, I came here uh, 20, 29 years ago. Uh, I got a job as a, a linguist interpreter for movies mm. that would go to Italy from English to Italian. Oh. Best job in the world. Yes. And um, yeah, and eventually I met my wife. Uh, we lived in Altadena, which is the foothill of Pasadena, and no much community there. And that's mm. something we were missing. Uh, it's pretty remote. Out there it's beautiful we were close to the forest uh and and the hikes but uh no chance to actually be part of a community mm. so that was something we were both missing plus we are both uh lovers of the ocean we wanted to come closer to the water and when our economical situation presented that we were ready to do so we we came down here and long beach was just the perfect place because uh People were super friendly and welcoming mm -hmm. and everybody loved dogs. We had a dog. So we met uh, a lot of people right away, made very good friends. And um, this is it. You said something that really resonated with me at your um, campaign event where you said, you know, we live by the beach, we live by the park. It's great, but we get to experience humanity. And I thought that yeah. was a great way to phrase that. But can you explain to our listeners what you mean by that? Sure. Uh, we live right on the corner of the access to the beach parking lot at Juanapero or Junipero or Junipero. I know, I say pick. Junipero, but I hear it <laughs> I, differently all the time. <laughs> I know. Well, when I first moved here, uh, they were telling me that Juanapero is how the locals call it. So I wanted to oh, be part of it right away. So Juanapero, Juanapero okay, is my there choice. We go. <laughs> yeah, even if it doesn't make any sense. But anyway, uh, right to the beach access and um, right next to Bixby Park. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of motion, lots of movement of all kinds of people, which is fantastic. But also we get to experience, uh, again, humanity in, in, in the positive and in the negative, unfortunately. There's a lot of um, uh, unhealthy, unhealthy uh, show uh, mm -hmm. that presents to our eyes daily. And I got involved right away with Friends of Bixby Park. Bixby Park is my backyard. Right. And when I first started hanging out there, I realized that there was a lot of, um, um, yeah, it's hard to find the right words, but uh, a lot of things that were not safe, safe, right. especially uh, with children, children around. So I started to organize cleanups to make sure that the park would be safe um, right, right from the, right in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then we started organizing events so that we could uh, activate the park and the more activation the more the negative element would push out of the park and then we started uh, um, creating an, we, we created an, an ambassador team hmm. where we would go out every day with green vest uh, with the sign ambassador trying to bring um, a presence of positivity in the park where we would you know uh, answer questions from anybody else, help people in need. We started doing outreach with unhoused. We also reported the, you know, the, the crime that was happening to the police to make sure the park was healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been like eight, eight or yeah, eight years now. And uh, I think we did great. Uh, the park is very happy today, but we still have a lot of work to do. And that's when I felt unheard from the city, like there's some things that we're not able to do by ourselves, and we need the, you know, the stronger help and uh, we're not really getting it. So yeah, that's one of the things that I've always um, said, but I've been challenged on that the more I cover politics. And I always say to people, you know, it's the squeaky wheel that gets the oil. So the more that you reach out to your, your city council members and the more you're vocal, the more action you'll see. But at, the more I'm reaching out to people, the more I'm hearing complaints that say the exact opposite. I've reached out, I've called and nothing is happening. Is that what you experienced as well? That is totally what I experienced. And, and I'm a, a strong believer that uh, groups on the ground, established groups like Friends of Bixby Park or, or our neighborhood association mm -hmm. are the best way to understand the problems right on the ground 
And I feel like the, our city council should listen to us, you know, and, and, and bring help to us because that's their job. They represent mm -hmm. us after all. I feel Friends of Bixby Park, he's a, he's a center of problematics of the Alameda Speech Neighborhood Association area of the Rose Park South of uh, Belmont Heights of uh, Bluff Park. Uh, we get a lot of uh, people coming to the park, you know, the mm -hmm. good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. And why not listen to us? Uh, right. We stretched our hand out right away when the new um, uh, city council came in, uh, but we felt unheard. And do other people in the community, have they reached out and experienced the same? Yes. Well, yes, because the funny thing is that I'm like the mayor of Bixby Park now. That's how people call me because I'm always there. You know, there's an issue. They call me. I'm like, why don't you call the police or you call your council member? Uh, and they all say, because nobody does anything while well, you mm. come over right away and fix the issues or at least try to fix that issue. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So yeah, not, uh, not a lot of responses. And that's also why I'm getting a lot of support now because I met so many people and I've done so much for the community that people know I'm not just a uh, lip right. service. I'm actually uh, able to roll up my sleeves and, uh, and do things. Yeah. The unhoused population is definitely, um, a trigger point for everyone, you know, in Long Beach specifically, yeah. we have a very high concentration of, of yeah. unhoused people. Um, you told a story about how you helped at least two people get housed and you didn't go into detail at your campaign event, but I definitely want to hear that story. If you, if you have time. <laughs> yeah. Two, the two people, I have more than two people on my, mm -hmm. in my, my list, but the special two people, I tell you, especially one, uh, her name is Lorraine. She's also a little popular on the, in the neighborhood because throughout my following or monitoring her, um, I had to ask help from the community. Right. So, you know, especially when Lorraine turned 90 or when she turned 91 or 92 or 93, now 94, I would ask a community to, can you send postcards, greeting cards, uh, send her gifts or stuff like that, or everything I needed, uh, they stepped up. Uh, mm -hmm. Lorraine was a, a, a lady that I kept seeing in the park. This is like five years ago. Uh, I would always say hi to her. She never said hi back. So that was a little challenging because I tend to talk to everybody and everybody always responds positively to my, right. you know, uh, <laughs> smiles. Your great energy. And she was, she was my challenge. So of course, mm -hmm. every day I would say a, a few more words to, uh, to her and uh, nothing. Until one day she actually called me and I was like, Ooh, today's the day. It was, uh, but she was very upset. She, she told me that she lived on the streets and that mm. she was uh, beaten up that night and uh, and her paperwork was stolen. So I immediately called for help. And I was very lucky that I had a, a, a private line with one of the officers at uh, Quality of Life. So he came out right away, but she wouldn't talk to him unless I was there. She would talk to mm. me and then I would you know, I would be the one in, in between. Anyway, long story short, uh, we discovered that she was 89 years old. And, and living I said, on the street? Yes. And I said, lady, oh you have no business being on the street. So from that day, uh, she became my, my project. That's not a great word, but uh, uh, we were able to put her in a motel. And I made sure that she stayed in a motel until she got all of her paperwork. So I did all the possible, uh, all the things I could to get her into housing. And funny story, uh, COVID hit. Mm. And the uh, motels have a rule where they have to leave every 28 days. So every 28 mm. days, I would pack her up and move her to a different hotel. Well, COVID hit. Um, we were all supposed to stay home, not to leave the house. You know, we had all these restrictions. Uh, the motel calls me and they said, she needs to go. I'm like, mm. no, she's not going anyway. She's 90. Mm. Uh, and uh, they say, we're packing her stuff and we're going to put her outside because she's not going to stay. So no matter how I tried to convince them to keep her because it was a city ordinance, not to leave the houses, et cetera, they would not badge. So I started calling the city hall and nobody would return my call. And I started writing in capital letters on the mayor Facebook page. And I guess before they could delete my message, a lot of people read it and they started chirping in. 
-hmm. And soon enough, I got a call from the house authority and they had an apartment for her and she was moved in. And so that was my, my best story because of the age. Uh, but there's a lot, of, a lot of other people that I was able to help with the help of other community leaders uh, who deal with homelessness. Mm -hmm. Yes. What could the city do better, in your opinion? Where are some of the areas that the ball is just being completely dropped as far as providing services to people on the street? Okay. Uh, this is from many years ago. The city mm -hmm. will come out saying that it takes 12 visits yes. to rescue somebody. Mm -hmm. Those 12 visits mm -hmm. never happen. I have people in the park. I know every possible unhoused in the park. I know when the city comes out. Mm. Those people are not talked to 12 times ever. They come out once, they get their names, they give them a little pamphlet and they move on. Mm. So there's no, there's no way these people are gonna uh, feel comfortable with an outreach person if they don't see them 12 times or enough times. They feel comfortable with me because I'm there every day. Right. So they know me. So if after three visits, I tell them, hey, you know, you could actually move on to a place or a, you know, a therapy place, a mental place or, or a house possible. Uh, would you like that? They say yes. Mm. So I don't think the number of outreach people is enough. I don't think their outreach actually is effective. Uh, I've seen the truck the famous truck coming out for, you know, for outreach and uh, the, the agents, the people who work for it, they sit at the truck. Mm -hmm. I asked them if they could, you know, they came to the park. I asked them if they could walk to one block for, to uh, second street from first street, because I had people with kids living in the cars there. And I was told, no, that's not how it works. They had to come here. And I said, but you're right here. You can walk, you know, 200 feet and talk to them. No, that's not how it works. And why is it not working that way? Mm -hmm. So we need more people. We need more outreach. We need more constant outreach. And the multi-service center is a million miles away and there's no uh, right for these people to reach it. Why? Mm -hmm. They don't even give them uh, uh, bus passes. So how are they supposed to go to those, you know, to, to get help? So there's yeah, a lot of dysfunction and a lot of disconnect within agencies. We have the agencies, we have the people, we have the money. Why don't we have a good system? Something right. is missing in the connection between agencies. Then the, the things that, that are mind boggling are, are things like we have three hotels that we purchased, what, in 2020 or 2021, right. supposedly they were uh, gonna open right away or after a year to, you know, to have, um, to, to be a home for homeless. And we declare a, a homeless emergency. And those motels have been closed for what, five years, they're still shut down. Mm -hmm. Nobody's in there. Why? A year and a half ago, we got the okay to build tiny houses. Why we don't have, why don't we have tiny houses yet? W where's Great the question. emergency? Where's the emergency? Mm -hmm. Where's the urgency? Why? Yeah, I think you make a great point because one of the, I live in district one, I live in downtown yeah. Long Beach. And uh, it's interesting because I have seen an increased presence of people kind of removing, I don't want to say an eyesore, but I know a lot of people feel that way. And it's kind of like, okay, let's just move them to another area. But I haven't seen the, hey, let me get you in the back of this van and let me drive you someplace where we can get you some help. I haven't seen that. And I, I think that would really go a long way to you know fight this issue at the same time though and i understand why we're all focusing on this unhoused issue because mm -hmm. it really is there's too many people that need a lot of help and i my dad always says you're only the, as strong as the the weakest link and i believe that but at the same time i did i didn't do the homeless count this year because i had no desire to get up at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> <laughs> but but last year i did it and one of the things that I found is we were talking to people that we thought were unhoused, but turned out they were housed, but they were still out collecting cans and things of that nature because they were barely housed. And so they were trying to get money any way that they can. And so then that also brings up another point, because when you look at Long Beach as a whole, 
there's a lot our young people, unless their family is in that 1% and they're wealthy right now, they're not going to be able to afford yeah. to live in Long Beach. So does city council have a responsibility to not only address those who are unhoused, but make sure that people who work in Long Beach or grew up in Long Beach can live here in the future? I know. I feel very rich because I have a house. I, I right. don't know how I would be able to afford anything today. Right. Uh, I feel for those people. Yeah, I've talked to many people who tell me that they make barely enough not to qualify for uh, subsidize or for mm -hmm. help from the government. And they are the ones that are suffering right now because they had to work three jobs to stay in their, in their home. Right. Uh, yeah, but prices are going crazy. Our taxes are up high. I don't understand why. Yeah, why we can't figure out a solution in that place. Uh, that's something I'm going to have to really uh, think over and, uh, and educate myself on. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that I, I need to understand better. And, and again, it's that borderline of where you make enough money not to get help. Uh, but is that a good quality of life? Right. I don't think so. Now... Your background is one of the backgrounds that would resonate with me as a voter because you're, you've a very diverse background. Your, your passion is definitely people, but sometimes politics is a little different than having that passion for people. Sometimes politics is about getting to that next you know, leg up, next, next position within the political or, or within our government system. Yes. So I feel like for the newcomers, we have a lot of people that are newcomers that are, are not quote unquote politicians, yeah. but they have passion for community, but they're going into a political system where people have been poli in politics for a long time. Have you thought about how you're going to get in there and make your voice heard with people who are truly politicians? I'm very charming. People like me and they listen to me. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. I'm just kidding. I, I think the most important thing is to keep your soul uh, clean. Mm. So not get corrupted or, or upset about where you're going to encounter because I'm, I'm going into a mountain of, of, yes, established ideas. I am somebody who listens to people. So, and I like to have uh, debates with people or, or, you know, put ideas together and find a compromise. So right. I, th I, I believe in teamwork. And I believe at the end of the day, everybody taking singularly has this experience, the same thing I do. Mm. So it's just how to get to a solution. Uh, I think a lot of people in government now are so used to the same talks and the same following the lead of, you know, of the status quo that have not, that have lost their, their capacity of listening to new ideas. Mm. I think, the way you present the ideas and 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 the fact that we all at the end of the day want the same solution uh is gonna help people like me new people to uh receive some attention probably and maybe make something move quicker yeah and i hear that a lot when i'm talking to people and i'm saying hey you know are you checking out i'm always plugging the long beach post are you checking out the long beach post are you are you exploring your candidates do you know what's going on and some i don't want to say sometimes because it's more than half the time i'll get people that'll shrug and be like what difference does it make you know it's gonna whatever they're gonna do they're gonna do it doesn't matter who we get into office i think people have become disenchanted with the thought that hey if we vote for the right candidate we can yeah. actually see change in our community. Have you experienced that as your campaign? <laughs> From the day one. First of all, okay. people are like, congratulations, are you crazy? <laughs> and, uh, and that is one of the things I, I feel sad about in my community, that people has, have lost trust mm. or have lost uh, faith that something's going to change. So they now don't call the police anymore if something happened because the police is not going to come. You know, they're not going to help somebody who passed out because, well, it was just one more today, you know. What? So people have put on these horse blinders and, and leave it in denial in a way uh, because they've seen no, no changes in our, uh, in our city. Uh, I hate that. 
I want people to be able to see all around them and enjoy everything. Uh, all kind of people from the house to the house, you know, there's no difference. We all need some attention and some quality of life. So uh, let's regain trust in our government. Um, I was reading that one of the things you want to address is something every single person who lives in Long Beach, no matter what their economic status is or what district they live in, and that is the parking. I know. I, yeah, I love parking. Let me tell you about parking. <laughs> Most of my friends uh, have parking issues, and me and my wife will have one soon because the parking we, the spot we're renting is going away. So we're really like, should we send a car? I don't know. Uh, so. One of the fascinating facts is that uh, going back three city council uh, members in my district, they all made studies about parking, parking studies. Mm. Who knows how much they cost? But, you know, they started these parking studies. And what happened to that? We never see results on anyone. Um, Suja Lowenthal did one, Janine Pierce did one, and Miss Allen now is, I think, doing one as well i don't know so i was like why can't they just go to the first one uh, who did it and just read the reports there and work on that but anyway aside from that uh me and my two friends who are really impacted by parking have been driving around the, the district and talk to businesses or churches who have ample parking and mm -hmm. who are not allowing people to park in their parking lot why it's a matter of uh, uh liability they said. So if that's the problem, the city should step in and take care of that issue. So mm -hmm. that 50, 100 parking spots we found just driving around town, uh, that's an easy thing to solve. The second one is permit parking for residents, especially overnight. Why? Mm -hmm. I keep asking that question. Oh, I kept asking that question in my previous uh, years, because that's another mind, mind boggling thing. Why don't we do that? and other coastal cities have it right. so why not us so my two friends who don't have parking they've been studying that uh, that route as well i think there's a lot of things we can do there's a lot of available parking uh, structures or lots uh, from businesses that can be open to the public especially overnight when these businesses are closed mm -hmm. why don't we do that i think there's a lot of solutions out there we just need to think out of the box Definitely, because when I first moved here, I would drive around. I'm like, this is this is a problem that can't possibly be solved. And I think that mindset kind of also gives city council a pass because I think a lot of people are like, this is just yes. this, this is just the way it is. Yeah. There's nothing we can do no, about it. I think it. there's something we can do for sure. Yeah, I am excited to talk to you and, and meeting you in person was great. Your energy is is and I love that there's so many people that came out there was one lady that came all the way from LA because she wanted to support you. And I think that speaks to your energy. Um, so I just want to kind of yield the floor to you, give you a, a minute or two to just really tell the listeners and the viewers why they should win your vote. Why does she win my vote? Yes. Because we need some fresh blood and some fresh ideas and thinking out of the box and somebody who, again, is not afraid to roll up her sleeves and, you know, tackle the issues every day. And somebody who wants a change for better, who wants a better quality of life for everybody, no matter who they are, or what social skills or social levels or colors they are. We're all one. We're one community. Thank you so much, Kathy, for joining. Thank it was you. great to meet you in person. It was great to Likewise. share your energy with, with my viewers and my listeners. I'm going to post the link to your website so people can learn Ooh. more about you. Your background right. is fascinating. I think they will enjoy that too. And you guys, don't forget, log in to lbpost.com. We have Compare Your Candidates. We have some debates coming up. Make sure you are informed so you can head out in March and make a confident decision when you cast your ballot. And don't forget, if you have to speak a word, make it a good one. And we'll see you next time. Don't sit down, listen.